Um, so let's get into it with our stories, our topics of this week, our, our discussion. Um, first of all, uh, our first topic, has Sting mattered? Uh, WWE reminds me that it reminds all of us that he's not the crow, which is good because I think some people might be a little confused when he first popped up there. So, and it really, what I wanted to kind of uh, talk with you guys, we're so close to WrestleMania. We had the appearance this week on, on Monday Night Raw side by side with Randy Orton. Um, and I think there was a lot of re-education that needed to happen. We had, you know, it's been 15 years since he was in, uh, can I say wrestling that mattered? This... Um, it's been 15 years since since he's wrestled. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, but no, I, but seriously. Remember, remember when everyone thought, hey, where'd RVD go? Ex- exactly. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, but still, the WWE audience doesn't know that he's done anything else. No care, whatever. So we have to remind why we care about him. And regardless, that is WCW and the story there. Like we've had WWE Network to have, be able to tell that story a lot over the last year, for instance. Um, so my question is, for obviously we know who he is and, and, and the importance of this is kind of negligible. But for the normal WWE fan, do you think they've been educated enough to care about this match? No. No, <laughs> no. I mean, I mean, it, it depends. I, I, like you said, the people like us look at it and they say, "Well, this is awesome, right?" I mean, Sting is is coming into a world where we never thought he would be before. Um, but I think to your average, let's say, 10, 12 year old who's watching this show religiously, they have no idea who Sting is. And, and I think that you know. I, I understand why he's on a limited schedule and they don't want to pay him. B, he's like a hundred years old. He would fall apart if he was actually, you know, doing anything. He's not a hundred. You don't think so? No, Mike? I don't. He wrestled full time in TNA. True. No, I think, I think they're not showing him that much to keep the mystique of Sting. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I think there's, there's the, that's one of the upsides to it, but I, I just, I don't think people have any idea who he is. I don't think the average fan who's who's not you know maybe of a certain age has any idea who he is and i i know I, I guess that's by design but I'm, I'm not sure they've handled this real great um on the other hand if he was on every week for two 15 minute segments we'd be bitching about that too so <laughs> that's true you know what i mean I, i'm not sure there's any way to win Right, right, right. How much, you know, how much, how much can you make somebody care? It's one thing like Hulk Hogan came back and say, he built this company, right? Uh, but Sting say, hey, he built this other company that closed down. I mean, it's not a great story for your, your good guy, right? That came back and fought the NWO and said he failed, you know? I mean, it's, it's just so, so strange. I mean, the only. Yeah, Alex. Okay. Um, I was just thinking, like, kind of on the flip side of it, though, the thing that I do like about how they've been portraying Sting, for all intents and purposes, the one thing they've been pushing since he started, Sting is the vigilante. Right. Sure. The, they're saying, oh, that he failed is only, like, the weird kayfabe slash storyline way of explaining why WCW folded. Uh, kind of blaming that on NWO, and, well, you know, instead of all the other stuff that actually happened. But the point is, he f- was the one, like, he was basically the guy that fought against the NWO. He was the one guy that represented WCW at a time when other other guys were flipping kind of back and forth, you know? Obviously, you had the outsiders from WWE to WCW. And, you know, Sting is the guy that stuck around. As they keep kind of pushing it, he was the guy that stuck around until the very end. So to that respect, I think they've been doing fine. As far as introducing him to new fans, um, I think as long as they've been the way, just pushing that uh, kind of the vigilante thing, I think has been working. But I do agree that he should be like around a lot more, or at least a bit more than than he has been. But then again, you have a world champion who's hardly around. So that's it's sort of, it's all, sort of kind of the same thing. In, in WWE, yeah. anyway, is part time is just how every, yeah. all the big yeah. guys work nowadays. You know? I mean, I, I think that. Yeah. I think they, they made a tactical error with what they're doing with Sting. Mm-hmm. Um, 
because they're introducing him as this guy who was one of the mainstays of WCW. Like, uh, they, they, they basically cut off Sting's history right before he joined the Wolfpack. Like, they're trying to, they're trying, like, there's a new Aliens movie that's coming out that's going to be a sequel of Aliens 2. Yes. That is what WWE is trying to do with Sting. They're trying to say, hey, remember when Sting was fighting the NWO and they just said, ah, fuck it, and joined the Wolfpack instead? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was a huge fuck up on, the, on WCW's part. We're not going to do that. We're still going to try and make him the guy who fights against injustice like the authority. And I, I feel like if you're going to do that and then you're going to try and at the same time say that he stayed in WCW to the very end, so he's going to fight the guy who destroyed WCW, then it should be Sting against like Steve Austin or Vince McMahon or The Rock because Triple H was injured when that whole alliance thing happened. Like the invasion, Triple H was out that entire time. He came back in 2002. WCW was already gone. The alliance had already completely integrated. Chronic was fired. Like, Triple, like, if you actually look back at the time period that they're talking about, Triple H had little or nothing to do with WCW leaving. Sure. Yeah. It, it, it's, a, it's a retcon of sorts, but, to use a, to use a but, comic term there. They're sort right. of choosing uh, how they want to portray the past because they control the narrative because, you know, it's made up. Um, <laughs> so... I, I, I see your point there, and people who who were through the whole thing sort of understand that. You know, they understand that this is not quite true, I guess. But um, you know, I mean, the biggest, I think, the biggest impact they show of Sting at this point is not necessarily who he is, but that he's he's portrayed as this antithesis of what Triple H is today. So he's not the corporate guy; he's this, you know portrayed as this, you know, the, the crow vigilante mm-hmm. I mean, justice unhinged kind of uh, you know, mm-hmm. character. And that, that's all fine, I guess. You know what I mean? I, but I don't know. A- Eamon makes a great point in the chat room. Right. Uh, he said what they should play up is that um, the guys Sting was trying to fight off, the guys that Sting was trying to save WCW from we're Triple H's best friends, right? Scott right. Hall and Kevin Nash right. and Sean Waltman. Exactly, Alex. Uh, I don't remember what I was going to say. <laughs> That's okay. I heard you try to break in there. Uh, but I, there was there was one thing I, I wanted to get your guys' takes on because I don't think we've gotten your opinions on what my entryway to Sting that I thought they should have done. Mm-hmm. There was a whole Monday Night War episode. 45 minutes to an hour long about the two mainstays of the Attitude Era, Sting and The Undertaker. Hmm. And, and it, like, if if it was Sting and Undertaker, and they just came out with this Monday Night War episode that chronicled, like, the history of Sting and how he was the mainstay in WCW, while guys like uh, the NWO jumped back and forth, Hulk Hogan came in to foul off the wolves, Macho Man came in, Mingy, all those guys, but Sting was still the constant. Sting was still the guy that fought for WCW no matter what. And then you had The Undertaker. The Undertaker who went through more changes than Madonna, like who who stayed and never left, like never left due to injury like Shawn Michaels, never left due to contract disputes like Bret Hart. He was there the entire time. And Undertaker was the mainstay. Sting was the mainstay. If they shortened that Monday Night War package, into a five-minute promo for WrestleMania, you guys would be amped about Sting versus Undertaker. And then we wouldn't have to waste Bray Wyatt. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. It, what, what you're describing, though, is having you know the, a logical uh, connection between you know these products that the WWE has out there, and that's, that's just asking way too much, um, of course. The question is, like, could those two guys have a match? You know, the narrative makes sense. The the you know the the feud makes sense. Could those two guys go out there and put on thirty five minutes or 
point. You don't need to. Ever. You don't think? So? Yeah, I guess. You, you did. When was what was the last Mania match that lasted thirty five minutes? Ah, you may. I mean, you make a good point, but I'm just saying. I think the match might not live up to it. I guess is my point. Not necessarily the, the length of the match, but you know, I, I think I think it's entirely possible we're gonna have a huge letdown, a huge stinker here with with st- both Sting's match and fucking the Undertaker's match. I I beg to differ. I beg to differ. Uh, Sting had a lot of really good matches towards the end of his TNA run. Uh, he had a really good match with EC3. He had a really he had a series of really good matches with Bully, with Bully Ray. Um. I think Sting is perfectly fine, especially the kind of style that Triple H wrestles. Triple H does a lot of stall and brawl, so I think that'll be okay. And as far as Taker goes, it's going to be nice to see him in a match where he doesn't get concussed three minutes into it by Brock Lesnar. <laughs> like, like, the reason that Taker match sucked last year is because not only did Taker get concussed, Brock is such a sloppy motherfucker that he kept <laughs> concussing him. Now, what what did, did happen? Like, do we know the start point of, of of that? It was very soon into the match. It was very soon, but like, what was it? Was it a, a botched move? Like, what was it? No, a it, suplex? It's just Brock. It's just Brock. <laughs> it's just Brock being Brock. Brock's got a yeah, Brock. Like, yeah, like I mean, Taker's an old guy. I mean, he can go. Yeah, Let's, yeah. Two years ago, Taker was wrestling six-man tag matches against the Shield, for fuck's sake. It was the Brothers of Destruction and Daniel Bryan versus the Shield. I mean, that match was a barn burner. That was awesome. Mm-hmm. You, know? I, you know, Eamon, again, God, I hate to keep giving him credit here, but he makes another <laughs> good point. He makes another good point here. If, you know, if Sting and, and Taker were the feud here, how many appearances would you have from these guys? Oh, on please. TV? They, I, I read that too. They built Cena and Rock over a year. The Rock made four appearances. That's true. True, but if neither one of them is making appearances, would no, you? No, but when, when one makes an appearance, the other plays mind games. That's all you need. They're both masters of mind games and light shows and. Titantron. Hey, hey excite. Yeah, all it, you need. It, it, accepting matches uh, through through Titantron is very apparently in vogue this year all over the place. So uh, I think we're good to go with any of that kind of stuff. So, all right. On that note, <laughs> like, wanna... honestly, if you had Sting and Taker, I wouldn't want them to be seen in a ring together until Mania because that's your money shot. Or even maybe that's a little bit. Shot. A stare off with the sign behind it on the raw directly before yeah. WrestleMania. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Uh, no, no, because the money shot is that. the two of them being in the ring at the same time. <laughs> That's true too. That's true too, I guess. Um, or maybe yeah. even they come in, yeah, um, they, they alternate. I, oh, sorry, yeah, Alex. It, oh, it's okay. I finally I remember my point from earlier. because uh, man Mike brought up the fact that uh, like it, the the question of why Triple H has to be the guy that represents WWE when he wasn't around for the invasion era. But the way I kind of see it, like Triple H is the guy that's still like with the company and not injured all or whatever. Cause uh, I mean, why couldn't Stone Cold do it? Well, he, you hear him every time anyone asks him if he wants to do a match lately, he's been like, Oh, you know, maybe, but <laughs> traditionally he's been just like, no, I'm dead. Yeah, and yeah. like Rock, because of a combination of injury and just wanting to do film, he's like, no, oh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, I mean, the only other thing so I remember they kept Triple H is also the avatar of Vince McMahon at this yeah. point. Yeah, I mean, but if they were gonna go I, like that's... stalwart WWE guy, yeah. if they didn't want to do Triple H, they could do John Cena. Mm-hmm. A Sting John Cena match would be killer. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because Cena's gonna get booed anyway. You might as well have him get yep. booed against a guy making his first appearance <laughs> in a Vince McMahon ring ever. Right. Like right. And then John Cena's kind of the gatekeeper for all these new guys. Yeah. All exactly. Right. I want to get to yeah. some other topics here, but first I want to touch on some stuff going on. Of course, hey, check out PittsburghWrestling.com. We got so much going on. Uh the big release this past week. We mentioned um uh last week the uh Cage of Fury. No, that's not right. I'm just combining a bunch of shows right now. Uh, Cage Cage Combat in Clearfield is the big one here. Uh, a lot of fun at that show. Uh, you can check it out with John McChesney in front of the show against uh, Joseph Brooks with Justin Labar. You might have heard of him uh, at ringside. I don't know. He loves wearing that neck brace. 
Um, a good point was that he wore a neck brace after getting pushed six weeks ago. So I don't know. Um, but uh, go I check out. Are very serious. Go check out that and so much else. Yes. Uh, January jackpot reloaded for the IWC. RWA's last show uh, seasons being six. No, actually, that should be uprising. I need to update that. I realize. Um, but also, we got a big. Well, one there was a sale. You can check in and new, sign up for the newsletter so you can get a free download, digital download, IWC's 100th episode. Jeez, I do that every week. Show, uh, including guys like AJ Styles, Delirious, all kinds of great names on there that you get for free. Just for uh, going to PittsburghWrestling.com, going down to the side here, you see sign up for Sorgatron Media and uh, stick your email address in there and you'll get that and updates on all kinds of wrestling and what's going on with all these podcasts. And uh, also, we just had a giant, massive IWC back catalog edition. Um, Some guys in there like Necro Butcher, Tito Santana is in there. Uh, Bobby F. J. Town is very excited because Mia Yim is on two of these shows. Uh, Superfly <laughs> Jimmy Snook, a friend of the show that we've had on a while ago. Sarah Del Rey we've been talking about lately. Delirious. Uh, ladder matches. Abyss. Baseball fields. Sexual harassment. Ric Flair. All kinds of stuff on this. The old Super Indies with guys like Jerry Lynn and uh, Davey Richards on there before they were big, big stars. Um, and, and, and Alex Shelley. Um, Matt Seidel. You know, Evan Bourne is on this as well. Go to PittsburghWrestling.com. Check out all the fun stuff. And those titles I was just mentioning, uh, the last few there, the, the back catalog, 3 to $5 each. You can check those out. Um, so please, PittsburghWrestling.com. Support that. Supports the show. Supports the network. And supports indie wrestling. So let's...